As I explained in an earlier lecture, an assay is a test system for measuring the biological activity of a drug target, where the target could be, for example, a G-protein coupled receptor. Assays are designed around drug targets or receptors. They can be designed to simply identify compounds that bind to the target, or a more sophisticated assay could be developed to detect compounds that bind and have a pharmacological effect. Well-designed and validated assays are key to the discovery phase of drug development. They can be designed for many different purposes and are employed all the way through from HIT identification to the clinical trials phases of the drug discovery process. This lecture will outline different types of assays and what they are used for. This slide lists the different types of assay that are used in drug discovery and development, and you should develop a good understanding of each kind. The main distinction is between a biochemical assay and a functional assay. The latter measures a physiological response. It is usually cell-based, for example, a fluorescent assay to measure the rise in cell calcium concentration in response to receptor activation. It could also be, for example, the contractile response of a muscle preparation to receptor or electrical stimulation. A biochemical assay may employ membrane fragments or isolated enzymes. The reporter gene assay I told you about in my last lecture is cell-based. But rather than measuring the physiological function of a cell, it uses DNA introduced into the cell to monitor a biochemical reaction. Binding assays are another type of biochemical assay technique. A simple and widely used assay in early drug discovery is the ligand binding assay. It is a method to detect the binding of a ligand or an unknown compound to a drug target. The drug target is a protein, usually a receptor or an ion channel, and the ligand can be any molecule investigated for its ability to bind to the target. In order to measure the binding of a ligand to a target, you need to have a parameter you can easily detect. For this we use radio ligands, which are ligands that have a radioactive isotope incorporated into them. The most commonly used radioisotopes are tritium, and iodine-125. The structure on the right shows the neurotransmitter GABA. Two of its hydrogen groups have been replaced with tritium to make it radioactive, and it can now be detected. Sulfur-35 is used to study ligand receptor binding as well, but it has a very specific use, which I will explain later. The typical radioligand binding assay measures the binding of a ligand to the drug target. The advantages of the assay are that it is simple and easily automated for high throughput screening. You will hear about high throughput screening in the next lecture, but it simply means that the assay can be scaled up to simultaneously test many compounds at one time. The essential purpose of the assay is to assess the proportion of a ligand that binds to the target at any given ligand concentration. In order to perform a radioligand binding assay, a number of things need to be available. You need to have sufficient target protein to enable detection of binding, so you would choose a tissue or cells that show a high degree of expression of the target, for example brain tissue for GABA receptors. A range of radiolabeled ligands are available commercially but not for every compound or target you might possibly want to use. This can limit the types of targets you can study. Scintillation counters are used to detect the radioactivity of the ligand and are widely available. It is important to realise that the scintillation counter detects all the radioactivity present, regardless of whether it is bound to the target or not. In order to evaluate how much of the radioactivity comes from the ligand that is bound to the target or free in solution, you need to have a method of separating the bound ligand from the free ligand. 
The next slide summarises how an assay is performed and the bound and free ligand are separated. The starting point can be either intact cells, homogenised tissue or isolated cell membranes. The sample is incubated for various times with the radial ligand. At the end of the incubation, the sample and incubate are passed through a filter. The solution containing the free radial ligand passes straight through, but the ligand that's bound to its target stays trapped in the filter paper. The radioactivity in the filter paper and solution are measured separately by liquid scintillation counting, and the radioactive counts analysed to measure the kinetics of ligand target binding. Before I explain how the data from a radioligand binding assay is analysed, we need to consider an important factor that can affect the measurements made. By definition, ligands bind to receptors with high affinity and therefore show specificity for the receptor. This type of binding shows saturation. In other words, there is a limited number of the receptor sites, so if you keep increasing the concentration of the ligand, Eventually, all of the sites become bound with the ligand, or they become saturated. But ligands can also bind to other components of tissues that are not involved with receptor activity. These interactions are non-specific and occur with a very much lower affinity. As the binding to the sites is not specific, there is an endless number of sites in the tissue to which the ligand can loosely bind. So as the concentration of the ligand is increased, the number of non-specific sites that become bound with the ligand keeps increasing. Therefore, non-specific binding is not saturable. We can distinguish specific and non-specific binding of a radial ligand by adding excess of ligand that does not contain the radial label. This is known as cold ligand. The cold ligand has a high affinity for the specific sites or target and competes for binding with the hot ligand. Because there is much more cold ligand than hot ligand, the cold ligand displaces the hot ligand from the target protein, leaving only the non-specific sites with radial ligand bound. This slide illustrates how, in practical terms, the specific and non-specific binding components of an assay are separated. Two incubations are performed. One is in the presence of excess cold ligand to displace radio ligand that is bound to specific sites. The radioactivity detected comes only from the ligand bound to non-specific sites. The other incubation has no excess ligand, so contains radio ligand bound to both specific and non-specific sites, that is the total binding. The radioactivity from non-specific sites is then subtracted from the total radioactivity to give the amount of radio-labelled ligand that is bound to the target sites. This slide shows a plot of real data obtained from a radio-ligand binding assay. The radioactivity, measured in counts per minute from the filter containing bound ligand, is plotted as a function of time after the start of the incubation. The data from both incubations are plotted. The red points show the total binding when no cold ligand was added. The black points show the non-specific binding measured after displacing the specifically bound radial ligand with excess cold ligand. The black points were then subtracted from the red points to give the specific binding in blue. You can see that the specific binding reaches a plateau or a saturated level after about 10 minutes, but the non-specific binding keeps rising steadily, so was not saturated. The plot shows that it takes about 10 minutes for the binding reaction to reach equilibrium. The incubation can be repeated at a range of radioligand concentrations to determine the concentration dependence of the ligand binding interaction. Measurements of specific binding are made when binding has reached equilibrium after 10 minutes in this example. Measurements of specific binding 
can then be plotted as a function of the concentration of the radio labelled ligand. This is known as a saturation plot, as it shows the ligand concentrations at which binding saturates, or is maximum. From this plot, the dissociation constant can then be interpolated as the concentration of the ligand at which 50% is bound to the target. Radioligand binding assays can also be used to assess the binding of a ligand that does not contain a radiolabel. These assays are known as displacement assays, as they measure the ability of a compound to displace a radiolabel from the target. This method of measuring binding is much more commonly used now than saturation assays. In this case, the cell or tissue incubations contain a single concentration of radiolabeled ligand, usually at a concentration below the dissociation constant of the ligand target binding. This makes it easier to displace than at higher concentrations. Different non-radioactive ligands are then added to the incubations at a range of concentrations, and the amount of radioactive ligand they displace from the tissues or cells is measured. This allows the potency of the displacing ligands to be measured, as illustrated on the next slide. In this plot, the amount of radiolabeled ligand that remains bound to the target is plotted as a function of the concentration of the competing ligand. Three plots are shown, representing three competing ligands, A, B and C, and each has different affinity for the target. These are apparent as different potencies at displacing the radiolabeled ligand. This type of plot is known as a competition curve and the assay as a competition assay. There are two clear advantages of this type of assay. Non-specific binding is clearly seen as the minimum level on the plot after displacement by the competing ligand is maximum, so a separate incubation to measure non-specific binding is not necessary. And secondly, only one radiolabeled ligand is needed to test a large number of ligands, so availability of the radiolabeled ligand is less of a restriction. The potency at competing with the radioligand for binding is indicated by the concentration of the competing ligand required to displace 50% of the specifically bound hot ligand, or its IC50. On this graph, it is measured by drawing a horizontal line at 50% of the maximum specific binding, then extrapolating the concentrations at which the curves for the competing ligands cross the horizontal line. In this case, the most potent drug is A and the least potent is C. This plot is much the same as the one on the previous slide, but it shows real data obtained from a competition assay carried out on the cannabinoid CB1 receptor. In this case, non-specific binding was subtracted before plotting the data. The assay used a tritiated form of the cannabinoid receptor agonist CP55940 and measured the abilities of the cold agonist, as well as two other cannabinoid drugs, to displace the labelled or hot agonist. The cold agonist was the most potent at displacing hot agonist from the receptor and anandamide the weakest. It is important to understand that these radioligand binding assays can only measure the binding of ligands to a target. They cannot tell what kind of functional effect the ligand has, for example, whether it is an agonist or an antagonist. It can only determine how tightly it binds to the target. In competition assays, the potency at displacing the radioligand is measured, but this is not a measure of inhibitory or antagonist potency. As in the case of the cannabinoid example, the competing ligand could have any effect, agonist or antagonist, or it could have no effect on the target protein. There is no way to tell from these experiments.
The scintillation proximity assay is a particular type of ligand binding assay, and I'll show you an illustration of it on the next slide. It follows the same principles as I discussed before, but it uses a slightly different method. Instead of using cell or tissue homogenates and separating out bound and free ligand to measure in a scintillation counter, this method puts the receptor right next to the scintillant so that only the bound radioactivity is captured. Isolated membranes containing the target receptor are attached to very small beads that are filled with scintillant, which can only detect highly localised radioactivity. When the radio ligand is in solution, it is too far away from the scintillant to be detected, so only the radio ligand that binds to the membrane on the bead is in the right proximity to activate the scintillant and be recorded. The ability to measure binding without the need to separate out the bound and free ligand by filtering is a distinct advantage of this method, but non-specific binding still has to be taken into account. On the left-hand side, the scintillation proximity assay bead is shown with its attached receptor. The radio ligand is not bound to the receptor, so although it emits beta radiation, it is too far away from the scintillant in the bead to be detected, and the radiation is dissipated in the medium. On the right-hand side, the radio ligand is bound to the receptor, so beta radiation is released sufficiently close to the scintillation to excite it to release a burst of light, which is recorded by the detector. There is one type of ligand binding assay that does give information about a functional effect. That is a specific assay for G-protein coupled receptor activity. This slide shows what happens normally in a cell when a G-protein coupled receptor is activated. Agonist binding causes a conformational change in the receptor protein such that it binds to and activates a G-protein. This activation involves binding of GTP to the protein. The GTP is then gradually hydrolyzed to GDP, which then dissociates from the G protein to end its activity. If agonist activation of a G-protein coupled receptor is carried out in homogenated tissues or cells or in cell membranes, it is possible to alter the conditions around the cytosolic side of the receptor. The GTP can be replaced with a non-hydrolyzable form of GTP, GTP gamma S. In these conditions, when the receptor is activated, the GTP gamma S binds to the receptor but it cannot be hydrolyzed, so it stays bound and the G protein is permanently activated. The more the agonist binds to the receptor, the more GTP gamma S binds. Since the sulfur can be substituted by sulfur 35, the amount of GTP gamma S bound can be measured by scintillation counting of the radioactivity. This acts as a marker for agonist binding to the receptor and receptor activation. So, by measuring the level of G-protein activation following agonist binding, the GTP gamma S assay therefore measures function, not just binding. The ability to increase GTP gamma S binding indicates agonist action, while the ability to prevent an agonist from stimulating GTP gamma S binding indicates antagonist action. I'm now going to talk about bioassays. This is a functional assay that measures the biological activity of cells or tissues and how they respond to test compounds. Bioassays are widely used to study basic physiological and pharmacological functions of tissues. A typical example is the organ bath, where isolated tissues, 
for example, the gut, the bladder, blood vessels, are kept in physiological solutions and at physiological temperatures, while muscle contraction in response to test compounds is measured. Bioassays have several uses. They can be used to identify an unknown substance by comparing the effects of the unknown to a known compound with well-defined activity in the assay. In an assay that shows a reproducible concentration response relationship for a known compound, it can be used to quantify the amount of that substance when there is no chemical method available. Once a binding assay has shown that a compound binds to a receptor, a bioassay is used to assess its ability to produce a biological response. In designing a bioassay, with the purpose of identifying an unknown substance with biological activity, there are a number of requirements. It is important to use the right assay. Use a tissue that shows a functional response to the substance. The unknown will be compared with endogenous agents known to have a particular activity profile in the assay. So it, it is important that the effects of endogenous agents are well defined in the assay and unique. For example, the ability of insulin to promote glucose absorption or the short lifetime and short-lived action of nitric oxide on the vasculature. Bioassays also need to be specific so that the response to different compounds acting through different receptors can easily be distinguished. They also need to be sensitive and respond to low concentrations of the unknown. Bioassays can be very sensitive for example, blood vessels frequently respond to nanomolar concentrations of drugs and even picomolar concentrations of some substances. Due to its biological effect, the concentration of a substance produced endogenously in a tissue may be measured by comparing its effects with known concentrations of the chemical. An example of this is nitric oxide which, because it is rapidly broken down in tissues, it's not easily captured and quantified. Some complex biologically active substances cannot be measured by chemical means, but they may be measurable as a consequence of their biological action. Examples include clotting factors, immunoglobulins, peptide hormones, cytokines, growth factors, vaccines, and monoclonal antibodies. Doses of insulin, for example, are defined as international units, or IU, not as a weight. This is because the same weight of insulin from two different batches may have different potencies at stimulating glucose uptake. The activity of each new batch of insulin is measured against a standard sample, the activity of which is well defined and acts as a benchmark for all other sources of the compound. The World Health Organization sets international standards for the manufacture of over 300 biological agents, and it maintains the standard samples against which new batches are calibrated. The principle behind the maintenance of biological standards was started in the late 1800s by Paul Ehrlich, a German physician and scientist who won the 1908 Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine for his work on diphtheria antitoxin. He was faced with poor quality control of antitoxin samples and had to find a way to establish a standard by which their antitoxin content could be reproducibly measured. He concluded that serum samples of a standard antitoxin could be dried and distributed for other samples to be calibrated against. He also defined the test dose of diphtheria toxin to be the minimum that, when added to one international unit of antitoxin, kills a 250 gram guinea pig within four days of injection. Some of the method has been refined, but the basic principle used today is unchanged. Once a compound has been identified as active in a binding assay, its biological activity can then be assessed using a bioassay. These assays measure the potency and efficacy of compounds. 
responses to the compound over a range of applied concentrations are measured. The response is then plotted as a function of the log of the dose given, if it's in vivo, or its concentration if it's in vitro. This is known as a log dose or log concentration response curve. From the plot, the concentration required to produce a defined response, usually 50% of the maximum response, is determined. The concentration giving 50% of the maximum response is known as the EC50. To indicate the potency of a compound, the PD2 is often calculated. This is equal to the negative log to the base 10 of the EC50 in units of molar concentration. Bioassays can take many forms, from individual cells to intact animals and groups of animals. Groups of animals might be studied to measure a behavioural activity. An example would be the ability of a drug to induce or prevent convulsions, or perhaps anxiety-related behaviours or sleep. The measurement made would be of the proportion of each animal group that responded. This is a type of quantal measurement or all-or-nothing response. A new drug might be tested in an animal or at a later stage in humans, for example to measure its effect on heart rate. The response in this case would be graded. The drug would be tested on several subjects and the results compared statistically with the same number of control subjects that received a placebo. A similar approach would be taken to bioassay the effects of a compound at the organ, tissue or cell level where the response would again be graded. Cell culture is widely used in early drug discovery because cultured cells can be engineered to express human targets meaning that the drugs are likely to interact with the target in the same way as they would in human subjects. This slide gives some examples of quantal and graded responses. A response is graded when it can be any value between a minimum and a maximum level. It is quantal when it is all or none or yes or no. For example, a mouse develops a seizure or it does not. Whether the response measured in the assay is quantal or graded, a dose response or concentration response curve can be plotted. The only difference is in the y-axis, which is defined as percent of maximum response if the response is graded and its percent of animals responding when the response is quantal. Drug potency is measured as the concentration producing 50% of the maximum response and is usually abbreviated as EC50 when the x-axis is concentration and ED50 when the x-axis is dose. When the purpose of a bioassay is to compare the potency of two drugs acting at the same receptor, then a complete dose response curve may not be necessary. This plot shows the responses to two muscarinic receptor agonists, each applied at two concentrations. As long as the concentrations applied are below and above the EC50 concentration, then an EC50 can be estimated for each drug and relative potency determined. In this case, acetylcholine is 10 times more potent than methacholine. A good bioassay will have the features listed in this slide. A sensitive assay will be able to detect compounds at low concentrations. A specific assay will be able to distinguish between compounds acting at different receptors. An assay is precise if it shows a steep dose response curve. In other words, the response is apparent over a narrow range of concentrations and a small increment in concentration produces a large increase in response. The dose response curve should also be reproducible so that there is little variation between measurements repeated at different times, on different preparations, at the same concentration. The assay should give an accurate measure of potency.
An additional consideration for bioassays used in the pharmaceutical industry is that they need to be quick and allow a large number of tests per assay. Cell-based bioassays are substantially more high throughput than assays involving tissues, organs or especially animals. This slide summarises the properties of bioassays. The advantage of this type of assay is that it measures a biological activity. It is the only type of assay that can tell you if a compound binding to a receptor can influence a biological pathway that leads to a cell or tissue response. The disadvantages are that compared with binding and reporter gene assays, bioassay tends to be less sensitive and more variable and it is also slower and more limited in the number of samples that can be tested. This slide summarises where in the drug discovery and development pathway different types of assay are typically used. Target validation involves confirmation of the biological activity of the target, so it employs in vitro and in vivo bioassays. These are likely to include genetically modified tissues and animals. As you will learn later, drug discovery involves screening large numbers of compounds and this requires assays that can be processed quickly and automated. A screen for compounds may involve a cascade of different assays, perhaps first testing for the ability to bind to a target, then to activate or inhibit the target. Bioassays are too slow for this, but biochemical assays, including binding assays and reporter gene assays, are widely used. Once the number of potential drug compounds has been narrowed down, cell and tissue-based bioassays will be used to assess their functional effects, as well as look for off-target effects, where they have effects on function that have nothing to do with binding to the target. These effects indicate non-selectivity of a compound. When selective and effective compounds have been identified, they would then be studied with in vivo bioassays, to determine their effect when delivered to the body. Bioassays continue until the latest stages in drug development, continuing to assess for safety and toxicity. <laughs>